This is Tornado Talk, a weekly podcast about one of nature's most fascinating phenomena. Share your tornado story online by email or call us toll free 800-439-1570. That's 800-439-1570. Now, meteorologist Jennifer Naramore and Dan Holiday, Tornado Talk is on. Severe weather is no stranger to southern Kansas. It lies in the heart of Tornado Alley, a very active region of spring and summertime hail, high winds, and tornadoes. It was hot and humid on the afternoon of July 7th, 2016 in Eureka, Kansas. The town of about 2,500 residents is in Greenwood County in the southeastern part of the state. The high school mascot, the tornadoes. Hot and humid weather can often set off summertime thunderstorms, but it was an unusual weather setup that occurred late that afternoon that targeted the town with one of the worst storms in decades. The EF scale heads for Eureka. National Weather Service Wichita Warning Coordination Meteorologist Chance Hayes. And with ample lead time before the tornado hit, many folks actually left and went to more suitable shelters than what they may have had at their home. Storm chaser Taylor Wright. We saw towers going up really rapidly from a storm that had just gone up near Emporia. And we knew with the environment the way it was, at that point, the tornado parameters were almost, you know, maxed out. Assistant Emergency Management Director Rusty Bittler. And I could see that there was numerous transformers flashing in the dark. I could see the the rotating uh, rain curtains. When the transformers were going off, it was just a greenish color over town. And you could just see block to block where it was hitting. Jacob Asherman, who along with Taylor Wright, tracked the twisters together. It wasn't until we were running from the tornado that we realized we probably had something bigger on our hands. And Eureka resident Nick Ball, who watched the storm tear through the town from his porch. When the wind really starts to pick up, and especially the uh, piece of sheet metal that wrapped around the pole on my front porch is when I knew we were being hit by a tornado. This is Tornado Talk, the story and tribute to the residents of Eureka, Kansas, following the tornadoes that occurred in Greenwood County on July 7, 2016. A series of ingredients came together on a hot, humid summer afternoon to produce severe thunderstorms, including multiple tornadoes, one that did EF3 damage northwest of Eureka and another EF2 that hit the town itself. 92 homes were damaged, 29 had minor damage, 13 with major damage, damage and six were a total loss. Governor Sam Brownback signed a state of emergency declaration. But the most interesting statistic of all is after two strong tornadoes that occurred at night, no one was hurt and no loss of life. On the afternoon of July 7th, 2016, Jacob Asherman, James Wilson, and Taylor Wright were set to do some storm chasing. They talked about traveling to a spot that looked favorable for storms in the northern Kansas, Nebraska, and Iowa area, but they looked over computer models that showed big storms would likely form in southeast Kansas. Taylor said, that's where they decided to go. We thought, well, we're only two hours away from the potential target, so let's meet up in Ottawa and kind of decide from there. And uh, once we got to Ottawa, it became clear that we were going to target Greenwood County, and we actually went to Eureka initially. Um, From there, we sat in Roselia under blue skies, and that's when I thought for sure we weren't going to see any storms. But we had them firing off to our north there not too long after that. Warning coordination meteorologist Chance Hayes at the National Weather Service in Wichita said his team was keeping an eye on the various features coming together that would eventually be trouble for Greenwood County, Kansas. We had a uh, surface low pressure center uh, centered over south central Kansas and we had numerous outflow boundaries oriented uh, eastward across central and eastern Kansas and basically what happens whenever you get those outflow boundaries it creates an area of convergence. And when we talk about convergence, that means an area where air is going to rise. And any time you get rising air and you have what we call instability, which is also rising air, you have different levels of instability. It could be weak, meaning the air is not going to rise very rapidly, or it could be strong instability where the air is going to rise violently or very quickly. And in this case, we had... uh, enormous amounts of instability or or the ability for the air to rise very violently uh, just off to the uh, north and east of the surface low pressure center along those outflow boundaries and and when those conditions came together just right it was just like a powder keg for these thunderstorms to develop. Taylor Wright said he and his team watched the powder keg type atmosphere play out. As we were sitting in uh, 
in Rosalia, just west of Eureka, we saw towers going up really rapidly from a storm that had just gone up near Emporia. And we knew with the environment the way it was at that point, the tornado parameters were almost, you know, maxed out because Cape had been much higher than what was forecast. And, uh, and, uh, there's lots of low level shear you need for tornadoes. So we, uh, we were sitting in Rosalia and we saw that storm by Emporia. But as we headed north, a new storm formed to its southwest as that one died off near Matfield Green. So once we saw that, we knew that the storm definitely had a good potential for tornadoes, but we ultimately ended up northeast of Tedderville, and uh, we sat there and a wall cloud formed. And once that wall cloud started spinning, I figured tornadoes were imminent. Concern began to grow with the National Weather Service. As the storm turned southeast, the tornado threat increased. Anytime that we see deviant flow on storms, it's very nerve-wracking to be honest with you because what it means is is that it's deviating from the normal pattern and when we talk about these right movers many times the storms have a tendency to be somewhat stronger and in essence what they're doing is they're kind of moving in a direction to where they're moving perpendicular to the inflow winds and the warm moist air that's going to help feed that storm so when it's getting that perfect flow directly into the storm, it has more moisture, and it already has the heat. It has the ability to become a little bit more volatile. Taylor Wright, who was storm chasing with friends, soon saw a brief tornado. Jacob Asherman said it didn't last long, but it would be a precursor as to what was to come. It wasn't until we were going through Eureka um, that we realized we probably had something bigger on our hands. Well, as we entered Eureka, we noticed the winds shifted, and we were getting wind from the right. We were heading south into town, and uh, the wind started to shift. And it was shortly after that that we saw power flashes right behind us and realized that there was actually uh, a big tornado on our heels, and that was when we uh, got out of town. Rusty Bittler is the Assistant Director of Emergency Management in Greenwood County. He has been a storm spotter since 2000 and decided to go to the Eureka Airport where he would watch the violent weather move in. It was dark, just after 9 p.m. In the distance, he saw power flashes. It was evident a tornado was on the ground and headed for a populated area. And if I remember correctly, the first tornado warning came out right around 9.06 p.m. So the, the first tornado sirens were actually not long after that. And when they updated the warning right around 9.40, somewhere in there, uh, the tornado sirens were sounded again. And that was just minutes before the tornado came through the city of Eureka. Warning coordination meteorologist Chance Hayes at the National Weather Service in Wichita said reports from storm spotters coincided with what they saw on radar. And we sat there and we continued to watch it strengthen. And, you know, not only do we have the ability to see where it's raining the hardest, and that's where folks basically go from the light blue to the yellows to the greens and then to the reds where it's raining the hardest and with some hail. Uh, In this particular case, the storm was rotating very rapidly. It had a signature hook echo, which is in the far southwest quadrant of the storm. So that's one of the things that caught our attention. But not only do we see that, we have the ability to see the airflow within the storm. And we take into account the motion of the storm, and we can see where the winds are blowing towards the radar and away from the radar. And when you see those winds right next to each other blowing in opposite directions, we call that gate-to-gate shear. And as we watched that gate-to-gate shear intensify as the storm dropped to the southeast towards the community of Eureka, uh, we definitely knew that we had something uh, significant moving across the area. A tornado had touched down about 10 miles northwest of Eureka. It was on the ground for more than six and a half miles and at one time a half mile wide. Winds were at 165 miles per hour. James, Jacob, and Taylor were chasing at night. And typically with no daylight, the only confirmation of a tornado can be determined when lightning strikes or by power flashes, indicating a tornado is doing damage. As we entered into the north side of town, we started getting some very heavy winds that kind of resembled tornado circulation. And then all of a sudden we started seeing these bright power flashes out our back window and we knew there was a tornado almost directly behind us. So that's when we uh, 
we initially, we couldn't actually see the tornado at that point, but that's when we kind of got just east of town and started uh, seeing the tornado go right through the town. Eureka resident Nick Ball said he watched the storms first develop on a trip back home from El Dorado, Kansas. His father decided to spot the storms outside of the city limits. Nick chose to stay home, and because the lightning was fascinating to watch, he grabbed his phone to record video. I, I was under my front porch facing the east with the grain elevator directly across the street from me. And right about the time when I noticed power starting to flicker, that's when I started to wonder if I was in a bad spot. But I don't have a basement or really any type of shelter here, and none of my neighbors do as well. And I just figured I might as well just ride it out. Like when the Transformers exploded in the video, I tried to use that as best to try to gauge what was going on. But quite honestly, unless it was blowing past right in front of me, I did not see all that much. The best way I can describe it, all I heard was 10. I heard 10 flying, but I couldn't really tell exactly where it was coming from. But with the elevator, I'd say right across the street, and just about every bit of their building is nothing but sheet metal, I figured it had to be coming from there. When the action picks up in the video, when the wind really starts to pick up, is when I knew we were being hit by a tornado. And especially the uh, piece of sheet metal that's wrapped around the pole on my front porch. And that's when I realized that we're in a lot deeper situation. For nine minutes, the roar of wind and sound of destruction hit Eureka. Winds were howling at 135 miles per hour, and the twister was about 150 yards wide. Nick Ball said once the storm came to an end, he ventured outside to look at the damage. At my home, I lost my carport. It flattened on top of my vehicles. The vehicles are, those vehicles were fine. I did lose a pickup truck to a tree. And between the two properties that I have, I lost 10 trees total. Assistant Emergency Management Director Rusty Bittler said others weren't so lucky. We had a spot where it was on Main Street between 11th and 12th, where we had a lot of roofs missing. Uh, we had some buildings that were basically gutted. We didn't have any completely on the ground in that area. Uh, towards the middle of town, towards that grain elevator, we had a trailer home park where there was oh, four or five trailer homes that were completely gutted and on the ground. Trees up, twisted around. The grain elevator had two buildings, I believe, that were completely destroyed. Of course, one was on the on the roadway. Uh, lots of lots of roofs gone, lots of tree damage, things like that. Little outbuildings gone. Uh, very, very fortunate the tornado that occurred northwest of Eureka did not occur in the city limits of Eureka, or I think it'd be a completely different story. Chance Hayes at the National Weather Service said not only were there two strong tornadoes that night, but they were occurring simultaneously. The EF2 and the EF3 were on the ground at the same time. We had a new mesocyclone develop to the south and east of the original one. So while the original tornado was occurring and causing devastation at that one homestead, the new tornado had developed further south and east up near the country club and moved through Eureka while the other one was still on the ground. Storm chaser Jacob Asherman said what happened that night was riveting for him to witness. Well, it was definitely the uh, most intense uh, chase I've ever had. The closest I've ever been to a tornado was that chase. We were probably about... When we were in town, it was probably a couple blocks away from us, so it was an intense experience. Rusty Bittler said officials moved into search and rescue mode. Over 90 homes had been hit. The town's nursing home facility sustained damage. He and his team had no idea if everyone had taken shelter in time. We knew we had buildings damaged. We knew that we were having to start search and rescue operations. It was just the, the eeriness of being dark and the unknown of what exactly was going to lay ahead of us. I think that was something that really struck me. We we didn't know how many people were affected. We didn't know how far northwest of Eureka this went, as far as if there was any houses that were damaged up there, which turned out to be from a separate tornado. But we didn't know how long this one had been on the ground. It just, uh, the whole uncertainty was beginning to set in about that point. The good news is that no one was hurt. 
No one lost their life. Two strong tornadoes had struck the area and everyone affected found shelter. Forecasters at the National Weather Service say it's their job to keep everyone safe. Chance Hayes learned how many reacted that night in and around Eureka. We noticed on the assessment when we went out, the number of folks that actually commented on the wireless emergency alerts that they received on their phones and how that is what prompted them to take action. And with ample lead time before the tornado hit, many folks actually left and went to more suitable shelters than what they may have had at their homes. So I thought that was very good thinking and and quite interesting once we heard that. Storm chaser Taylor Wright credits the National Weather Service for the difficult job they had that night, especially when earlier that day the tornado threat was not obvious. The National Weather Service did a great job with the with warning this storm because it was early on in the the storm's life cycle when we really started noticing rapid rotation in the daytime that they actually warned it um, and it stayed warned for quite some time uh, before it was even in Eureka so and when we first pulled in north of Eureka we noticed there the sirens were always were already going off so we were pretty happy about that because oftentimes you go into a town with a tornado warned storm nearby and the sirens aren't going off for whatever reason so there was uh there was a, a really good warning time on the storm and it goes to show that even when things don't pan out as expected it, when the storms fire in a volatile environment when they're not really supposed to um there's still you know adequate warning time and also um since there's very little chasers on the storm That kind of goes to show how chasers still have a hand. Chasers and spotters still have a hand in the warning process. I mean, if it weren't for a few early reports and the nighttime reports north of Eureka, that warning might not have been as... uh as effective. It was Chance Hayes and his damage survey team that would bring the EF scale to Eureka. Their job to determine the magnitude of damage. That would let everyone know how strong the tornadoes were that night. Well, I'm going to start with the community of Eureka. And basically what we did on this particular day, we we began at the end of the tornado track, which was just to the south and east of the city of Eureka. And then we worked our way back to the northwest. And once we got into the community of of Eureka, initially we saw a portion of a roof blown off. uh, And then once we looked off to the northwest, we noticed that the city had been basically barricaded off. And we noticed that there was significant tree damage from that vantage point. And then once we gained access into the site and were walking through the community, uh, we just saw the complete devastation of, of trees. And that was quite impressive to us. And then there were several homes that also sustained significant damage. Several lost their roofs. There were some mobile homes completely uh, decimated, as well as uh, a metal barn with a facility right near the nursing home. And it was just uh, kind of awe-inspiring just to sit back and and look at the damage and, and realize how fortunate the folks in the city of Eureka were that there were no injuries and there were no fatalities. Uh, even if there wasn't a lot of structural damage where the homes were completely wiped out in the community, you know, the trees falling on the homes, or if folks happen to be outside or in their vehicles, the the trees falling on them uh, really could have caused problems. And then once we made it through the, the community of Eureka and, and we came back and gave that a preliminary rating of an EF2, we continued on to the northwest where we knew that there was another tornado touchdown and another home that had been hit by the tornado and once we got to that site we recognized very quickly that it was a much stronger tornado the path width was much wider and the tree damage was much more significant and the home was completely wiped off of its foundation at that point in time and we spent some time there really assessing the construction of the home and and based on you know the home's construction and and the level of tree damage, you know, we assess that with the high-end EF3 tornado. And then there was another one off to the northwest up near Otis Creek Reservoir, which is on private land up there, and right in the middle of the Flint Hills. So it's very difficult to detect what actually happened from that Otis Creek Reservoir 
to where the home sustained the EF3 damage. Cleanup in Greenwood County began. Some residents were homeless. Many didn't know where they would stay or what they would do, but Assistant Emergency Management Director Rusty Bittler said he watched the community come together like never before. We have people that are cooking meals for us every day called Community Link, a group that does meals. They've provided breakfast, lunch, supper every day since this thing. Uh, They're doing it for the community, for the responders. People continue to come in and help. Uh, Just people loaning their equipment, loaning chainsaws, just loaning hours of their day to come in and help clean things up. And it's been countywide. It's been statewide, to be real honest. It's just been the support for Eureka and Greenwood County has been overwhelming. As far as the, the cleanup effort in the city of Eureka, uh, we are very fortunate. We've had lots of other agencies, such as KDOT, uh, Lyon County, Woodson County, Oak County, Coffee County, all the surrounding areas, Butler County, sending dump trucks, excuse me, private organizations, sending in semis, dump trucks. We've just made amazing progress. Nick Ball shared the storm video he captured on Facebook. His friends checked in to see if he and his family were all okay. Knowing now what he didn't know then, he realized how close he was to the tornado and believes that if there is a next time, his smartphone will be with him taking cover. I don't normally take videos of weather events or anything like that. And if I had it to do it over again, I probably wouldn't have taken this video. I would have gone to try to find shelter or barricaded myself. I'd did I feel scared? No, but I realized I did not purposely try to put myself in harm's way just to get a piece of video. And that if anybody else is ever going to do that, to please make sure that they are safe when they're doing it. With EF2 and EF3 tornadoes on July 7th, 2016, residents in Greenwood County are thankful that the only things that were lost are things that can be replaced. Rusty Bittler is grateful. We have been extremely fortunate to have no injuries due to the original tornado and no fatalities. Nick Ball agrees. I'm not known for my positivity, but I recognize when I've been blessed. And this is one of those times my parents, they live for Eureka, if you've ever been here, on the other edge of town, but it still only takes about two minutes to get there. And they're, they didn't even have a limb down. And they were safe and everything. And like I said, with all the volunteers' efforts and the community coming together, I've just been truly blessed. Next on Tornado Talk, a debate on the future of tornado sirens. With new ways to be warned, are sirens antiquated and costing too much to install and maintain? Should they stay or should they go? Saving or slashing sirens on episode 14 of Tornado Talk. This has been Tornado Talk, powered by the stormreport.com.